Have you ever known anyone who second-guessed themselves? Who almost immediately after they made a decision began to, to wonder if they had made the right choice? I say, I think very confidently, without a doubt, every one of us at one time or another, sometime in our life, we have made at least one decision that we regretted. Now, we won't ask for a show of hands, but I think it's probably, if it's not, someone's hedging their bets a little bit or maybe holding back a little bit. But, you know, I'm really not talking about that today. What I am talking about, or am going to talk about, is the tendency on the part of many of us to doubt and to play what I call the if-only game. When I say that, we do that sometimes within ourselves, but sometimes we also do it especially as a part of our life as a Christian. I think it is normal. Now, would someone after services define for me normal? And we'll know what we're talking about. In the meantime, we won't because normal comes in so many different shapes and sizes and colors. But I do think it is normal, but it is certainly common that we often reach a point in our life where we might question an earlier decision that we made. Looking back, we say, mm, maybe shouldn't have made that decision exactly the way I did. Maybe should have gone in a different particular direction. We now have you know, more facts at this particular point in time than we did at the time we made the decision. Uh, things are a little bit clearer. Maybe we're a little older, a little wiser. Uh, so all the things that go along with that. They, whoever again they is, say hindsight is 2020. Uh, if we can ever again figure out normal and they, we know a lot of, a lot of knowledge that is going on in this world today. You know, even, and I've seen this happen before, many married couples, especially after the glow of the first love has dimmed a little bit, and you have time to see that that other person actually has a flaw or two or three. And I'll stop there before I go any further. Uh, there's some giggles out there. I wonder if maybe that's happened. Some wonder after that, did they spend enough time really looking through this particular decision that they made in their life? And I think most of us do come to the fact that uh, that is the case. But as was brought out uh, in a sermon recently, it's getting worse and worse. 50% of all marriages end in divorce. And I think that was, John said that was a 2012 statistic, and the last time I saw that on another thing I was looking up, it was closer to 52% now of all marriages in in, in in divorce. Do we give time and thought to the decisions that we make? I think it's definitely true in life that we can, and we do make poor choices from time to time. I won't ask for a show of hands of how many of you that you know, think that there's at least one that you made that was poor or bad, but we do. From that, we have to learn a lesson, and that's according to what has been called the old hard knocks of experience. They say that there's no better teacher than experience. It's not the best teacher. You would prefer to learn it some other way, but experience is certainly a good and an effective teacher. And again, I think we have all played at one time or another the coulda, woulda, shoulda game. Well, I could have done this, I should have done that, and I, you know, if I'd have just done this, we'd have been okay. But we do that, I think, way too much in our lives. However, most of us, again, in looking back, I think it takes a little bit more of a subtle form in our life. Regret often takes the shape of what I'd mentioned earlier of the if only. When you say, if only I had, and you fill in the blanks for you, as they fit for me or they fit for you, if only I had done this or made you know, a little bit different decision, you know, we start talking about that. We start regretting it. Things would be better if I had only done that. Well, maybe not. No matter what the nature of our regrets, they can sometimes be a heavy burden for each of us to carry around throughout our life. The question is, how do we turn loose? How do we let go of bad decisions that we have made in our lives? I think maybe taking a look today at some of the more fundamental concepts of our underlying belief system, something that you and I all believe in, might be a good place to begin. 
don't know how many of you watch television very much, but there is an advertisement, at least I haven't seen it in some time, but there used to be an advertisement on television, <coughs> excuse me, by Fidelity Investments, of uh, following the green path. A little path would come out on the TV and they followed it. They go to financial success. Of course, that's an effective advertisement for, for Fidelity. They're trying to get more customers to come, you know, invest with them. Most of you in here are familiar with The Wizard of Oz, where Dorothy had the yellow brick road to follow back home. Now, some of you are too, well, there's not too many in this room too young to know that. Uh, uh, most of us will probably have heard that before. In effect, in both instances, the suggestion is if you follow this particular way, with fidelity, the green path, you may you have financial success. With Dorothy and the yellow brick road, you're going to make your way back to where you'd want to go to. I think in both instances, the suggestion is if you follow this way, you will have success. But I think too many of us are still looking for the yellow brick road. In effect, that myth of a guaranteed right path, our job is to find it, and then if we follow that, then everything will be all right in life. Everything's going to work out. We're on that right path. We're going to go down that road. That is somewhat of a mirage in the way life is and the way things actually go through life. But we do know this. God holds the key to this proverbial path, and when we discover it, we will have some type of proof that we are on that target. We are on that right road. Now, this one may be Again, but I'm after looking at this audience again and taking a second. There's only a few probably here. Many years ago, a group called the New Christie Minstrels. How many of you remember the New Christie Minstrels? Okay, well, some of you do anyway. They had a song called Tiptoe Through the Tulips. Anybody remember that one? Okay, it's one of their favorite ones. I used to enjoy singing along with it. That, in a way, sometimes epitomizes how we sometimes feel is our need to go through life tiptoeing, being real, real careful where we go. We don't want to step on one of the daisies and crush them. But when the confirmation that should result by doing this, by following this right path, does not arrive sometimes, the second guessing begins. And again, if only I had made this right choice, if only I had done it another way, the second guessing begins. If it, the, the, the path would be smoother if I had just only made this correction along the way. And, and maybe it would have, but at the same time, I want you to consider something else. We do this if only, if only, if only sometimes in, in rationalization and trying to decide, you know, how can I maybe change my decision making the next time around? A good student, especially a good student of the Bible, knows that at least at some level, and even we come to an understanding that the Bible does not teach that there is somehow a yellow brick road. Now stay with me for a minute. There is no guarantee and certainty in life other than the future life to come if we follow that path right to that correct path. Because there's too many things that happen in this life. There's too many things and every one of you could sit here and give real life examples of times where you have had difficulty, times where a decision has gone wrong and you've stepped off a path and have had decisions to make as a result of that and wondered, you know, if I'd only done it this way, if I'd only changed this, uh, at least I have. So I can only speak from my own experience. As I said, the guarantees and certainty in life apply only in the sense of a promise of a life to come. For now, as the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 12, it says, for now we see through a glass darkly. We're not always able to see everything we like to see. We see through a glass darkly. And spending our life searching for guarantees does more harm than it does good. It can leave us cautious and sometimes anxious about most everything in our life if we're not careful. And at the same time, always fearful that our next decision, our next choice, might be something that, you know, another mistake we'll make. It might be something we will regret doing. We fear changes because we worry about them. Worry leads to doubt. And then, as it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, God has not given us the spirit of fear. 
God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So that's totally contrary to previously what I was saying in that regard. That's not God giving us that as we go that way. Eventually, striving to find certain guarantees and find, finding certainty in life can lead us to a form of atheism. Now, stay with me again on that. It's not that God does not exist, but that he is not answering my prayer. Therefore, he is not guiding my path. I can't find the yellow brick road, so I must need to do more. Now, this may sound a little extreme, and I am being somewhat facetious, but unfortunately, this is how some of us reason and live. And I have talked to numerous people over the years who have come to a, an intersection or a point in their life where they've had some bad decisions, some bad difficulties in their life, and they want to know, you know, uh, what do I need to do? Why did I make these bad decisions? And as I said, unfortunately, this is how some of us reason and some of us live our lives. <coughs> as though now that God has not done what I expect of Him, it all depends on me, when the actual truth of that is the reverse of that. Now, now maybe we have never expressed it exactly that way, but in essence, that is what we're saying. And if that is true, if that is where we have come to, then we really need to do a rethinking of our position. There is a better way to view the past and also the present circumstances that we sometimes, you know, find ourselves in. And that's not a one of us in here that hadn't found ourselves at one time or another in a circumstance or a situation where we needed to do some changing. That view, that way, that approach is rooted in the sovereignty of God. If you need a title, that's the name of this, or the title of this message, the sovereignty of God. No matter what your spiritual background, no matter the amount of time you have spent walking in this way of life in Christ, we will all eventually come face to face with the sovereignty of God in our life. This theme of God's sovereignty is, is webbed th throughout the Bible. It's all over the place, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. One particular scripture that I like and I picked out for this one is Proverbs 16 and verse 9 where it says, the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. We may make all kinds of plans, but when it comes down to it, in the final analysis, if we're allowing God to work this in our lives, he is going to direct our steps. We can plan all we want to. We can map out one year, five year, and 10 year plans, make all kinds of to-do lists. And that's not necessarily wrong or bad. But it is God that orders our steps. He is the one who opens and closes all of the doors that really matter. Another couple of scriptures that i like to go over to make that even maybe a little clearer. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, To everything there is a season, and there is a time to every purpose under the heavens. There are times when and all of us know this, we know it within us, that God's ways are not necessarily our ways and God's thoughts are not always our thoughts. He has a purpose to our end. And He is going to do, according to the Scriptures, everything necessary to assist us to be there at the end. Sometimes it may cause us to get you know, rattled a little bit. It may cause us to have some difficulty in our lives. But God is going to do that. Second Timothy chapter 1 and verse 9. It says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling? Not according to our works. Nothing that we have done, nothing that we have accomplished in this life. In fact, is in most cases in spite of us. But according to His purpose and His grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Then there's the famous discourse, which I'm sure you're all familiar, over in Job chapter 38. When Job came before God and the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, beginning in Job chapter 38 and verse 1, and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? That's a little bit disturbing for God to say that to, to you or to me or to anyone else. Who are you, in effect, that comes before me with these words 
but you don't have any knowledge. What are you basing all this on? Gird up your loins now like a man. Wow. I can only imagine what Job was thinking when God told him to gird up his loins like a man. I imagine that hit him right square in the nose. For I will demand of you and you to answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare it if you have understanding. I'm sure Job was silent at that point in time. But again, it, it shows us where God is. He is there from the very beginning. He is guiding our footsteps. He is opening and closing doors that we don't even know about in many cases. I think each of these verses helps put life into a, a little bit different perspective. It should give us all a little pause when we consider our own life. Because without really knowing why or even how, I think all of us have an innate sense of a need for something to be bigger than we are. We have a need for something that brings order out of chaos. And I guarantee you this world is in about as much chaos as it could possibly get into. But the problem is we know, according to Scripture, it's going to get worse before it gets better. That's not very comforting in one sense of the word. But we do know it is going to get better. The Apostle Paul begins an epistle to the church in Ephesus with probably his most complete treatise on life. Over in Ephesians chapter 1 and beginning in verse 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. I think that describes all of us right there, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as He has chosen us. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy, that we should be sanctified, that we should be set apart, and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will. Not our will, His will. His will is going to be done. Then skipping down to verse 9, it says, Having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasures which He has purposed in Himself. What God's will is, what He has purposed to do, that's what's going to happen. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him who works all things after the counsel of His own will. Do we understand what that scripture is saying? That it is according to God's will, according to His purpose. He's the one who has called us. He is the one who has set us there to make that journey with Him. And He has promised us that He will do everything within, in effect, His power without actually taking a knife to our back and pushing us to bring us to that point. Now, before someone says this, I want to make a disclaimer. In reading this scripture and saying what I've said, I am not a believer in full predestination in the sense that God is going to direct everything that we ever do, make every step we take, turn every red light green, and you know all these things that some people do seem to believe. But in the context of this amazing story that you and I call life, <clears throat> every one of us have a vital part in the future. It is a story that can be hard to believe. It's a story that at times can seem almost too good to be true. It but is a true life drama where every part of the story serves a larger purpose, something bigger than we are. Something sometimes that all of us, you know, we get to a situation where all we have is in effect a peek behind the curtain 
Now, we'd like to see the whole program, but all we can get is a peek behind the curtain. And that can be frustrating sometimes. In Romans chapter 8, in verse 14, Romans chapter 8, beginning verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons, the children, the sons and daughters of God. Are we led by the Spirit of God? For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Very similar to the scripture we just previously read. But you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Do you know what that means when it says joint heirs with Christ? That we're going to share in effect, in the will, that we are heirs jointly with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in each of us. Now, again, I'm not asking for a show of hands. Is there anyone in this room that has not suffered at one time or another with illnesses, with deaths in the family, financial problems, family problems, whatever. You know, you, you run the gamut. All of us have had one or more or all. But the present, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be real, revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. This whole creation, from the very beginning till now, waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who has subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know, in verse 22, that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. I'm reading a book right now, <clears throat> and it's about a young man who left the East in the early 1800s, followed up the Missouri River to get over to the West, to the, what they call the, the Big Blue Mountains. His goal was to see the creature. That's how the author expressed it, and I wonder if he got that from the Bible, this same scripture here. The creature being the creation of God that so many people had not seen at that time the vast plains that they had to cross before they got to the mountains. And then can you imagine when you have spent weeks on end going across these plains that never seem to end, and all of a sudden you begin to see in the far western horizon something that looks like a cloud. And then slowly, but slowly, and day after day, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And you've come from the flatlands on the plains or wherever you come from, and all of a sudden you've got these gigantic mountains coming up in front of you. The Tetons are over there. And they mention in the book the, the origin of the word where the Tetons came from. If you don't know it, I'll tell you later after services. <laughs> but anyway, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to see, in effect, the creature. And this is what this scripture is talking about. Each of us are looking for something that we haven't seen yet. And the things that we're going through now are not worthy to be compared with the glory which is going to be revealed in us. But this whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain until it comes about. At the same time, when we talk about the sovereignty of God, it is sometimes a term or a concept that can be and is abused, I think. <clears throat> the reality that, quote unquote, God is in control. And I've heard people who have said this after everything in the world you can think of. They've just gone through a tsunami, a hurricane, an earthquake, their house is burned down, uh, any number of other bad things, and they say God is in control. That is of little comfort in the face of a tragedy like one of these natural tragedies or other man-made disasters. 
we as human beings cannot just cover over every doubt <clears throat> and every grief that comes our way with the calm acceptance of, well, that's just the way it is. That's just the way it is. Many do not understand or accept that if God is in control, how he could allow such a tragedy because they do not have the understanding that this is allowed by God because he gives us the freedom to be free. We have the freedom to make choices and make decisions. We live where we live because we made a choice to live there. We find ourselves in circumstances and situations because we had the freedom to make that choice. If every time we made a choice in our life and God knew that that was the wrong choice, he smacked us down and turned us in a different direction. Now, it would work, but that's not the way God designed it. He has given each of us free freedom, freedom to make choices. And so sometimes when those choices backfire and the natural results of that come about, in effect, don't blame God by saying God is in control. Well, God is in control, there's no question. But he's not going to always, in every circumstance, in every situation, intervene. Because he has a goal, he has an outlook, he has something, a prize, so much further out than where we are. And he wants to make sure that each of us are going to be there. And he's not so much concerned about our daily comforts, whether or not we're a little bit uncomfortable, or a little bit cold, or a little bit too hot. From the standpoint of practical, everyday life, the effect of the recognition and then the acceptance of God's sovereignty mostly affects the way we frame the experiences that we go through in life. Changing our sense of who holds the power in our life and at the same time helping us to accept the past, trust the future, trust the future with a certainty of hope because we know what that's going to be. If we interpret our life based solely on the data that is visible to each of us, we can easily get mired down in regrets and even sometimes self-reproach. But accepting and understanding the sovereignty of God gives us not only a much larger framework within which to work, but it gives us a true reality of what God wants us to do. In looking back, it is then easier to see what we may have thought was a meaningless detour in our life sometime was actually an important piece of the path that God has laid out for us. Now again, I'm not asking this, but I'm asking it rhetorically. Can you think of something that happened in your life that you thought was a very difficult situation where it's bad, you shouldn't have done it, but somehow or another it worked out right anyway? That's what I'm talking about. God has laid out a path for each of us. And sometimes he opens and closes doors that you and I don't really understand or see. As opposed to looking at time as sometimes, you know, spent in, in effect wandering around in our life, that may be the time of a very meaningful experience that was preparing us for something that God has planned for us way far in the future. Ron Dart once gave a sermon one time talking about some difficult times that he went through. And he said they were difficult times and he pled with God in certain circumstances and situation. But he found out much later he went through that because he then had people who came to him who were going through the exact same circumstance and situation. And God was simply preparing him to be able to answer that person's questions and to help them. Ever happened to you? It's happened to me. I can very clearly see now, in retrospect, the hand of God in numerous intersections in my own life. And I mentioned that in a message a couple of weeks ago, several weeks ago. Before I even had a clue concerning the sovereignty of God, what I thought was lost time, I can now see was God preparing me for something he has waiting for me to see and for me to get my act together so that I can take care of it. I think this is a crucial point for all of us. Are we going to allow the detours, 
the quote lost years that we've gone through and all the mistakes and bad decisions we have made to take their proper place in our life or are we going to let them continue to bug us and bother us a life that is being orchestrated and directed by God who loves us who wants us to be an integral part of his plan and a part of his family or do we want to continue to play the coulda, woulda, shoulda games or look back and say, if only. That's not what God wants us to do. Sure, every one of us in here wasted time. We've made some bad decisions and we'll probably make a few more. I'm proving that almost every day. But you know, if God can use stones and a jackass to fulfill his will, I think he can handle each of us. We're, you know, clay in his hands in that sense of the word if we allow him to be that potter to do it. He can make those times in the past be meaningful if we quit worrying about them and letting them bog us down. Quit worrying about the past in one sense, even the right now. When we feel like we're sometimes like an old fish flopping around and floundering around out of water, don't feel that way, but instead look to the future, the future plan that God has for each of us. In Job chapter 14, in verse 15, he says, You shall call, and I will answer you, for you will have a desire to the work of your hands. It is God's desire that each of us, as we become the clay in his hands, that he form us into what he wants us to be. And we can't, you know, we can't jump off the potter's wheel. We may eventually fall off of it through something that we do, but that's not what God wants us to do. There's an old expression that at least to me is very comforting, and it's because it is, is a true expression, that God never wastes, He never wastes an experience on us. The scripture I used and titled my sermon last time I spoke here was Romans chapter 8 and verse 28 where we know that all things not some things not most things not a few things but all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are called according to his purpose and I had several of you mention to me after services last time that you had could see that in your own lives where things that had happened that now you can see that God turned them around and made them good. In the real scheme of life, there is no such thing as wasted time. Each experience that we go through can contain seeds that one day will blossom in a way that today we cannot even begin to imagine if we live in the comfort and the shade of God's sovereignty. Now, obviously time and chance happen to us all. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 11 says that. Time and chance happens to us all. It's plain and clear. It's what God tells us. But we are not at the mercy of our bad decisions or our mistakes or even the choices of others that affect our lives. God is bigger than all of that. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 1 says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, and as the rivers of water, he turns it whichever way he will. We're being directed by God. We may not always understand it. We may not always see it. We may not be able to see it when we look back, but we will see it at some point in time later in our life. God is able to direct our lives and those of anyone who touch our life. But more than anything, the acceptance of His sovereignty in our life allows us to accept the past, to anticipate, to look forward to the future, with total trust and total assurance that it's all going to work together for good. We've all made mistakes. We've all made a few bad decisions in our lives. As I said earlier, we'll probably make a few more. That's, that's life. But in Christ, there is meaning in even some of the things that we wish we could erase. I've got a friend that I grew up with and has been a best friend since the seventh grade. We joke with each other. We say each, we don't ever talk around each other because we both know where the bodies are buried. 
There's a lot of things we wish we could erase about our past life. But they're part of the past. Forget about them. God will put them together and make them work for good. Experience we've had, pain that we have suffered, may, as I said earlier, enable us to be able to comfort others who are experiencing those same hurts. We never know what God is doing in our life, why things are happening. And sometimes, as I said, it's many days, weeks, months, or years later before we may do that. All of this does not imply, even for a moment, that all of our life stories will come out in a neat package and understandable. It just doesn't happen that way. We have had and will have some loose strings, is a way of expressing it, in our lives that may not show a better ending that will sometime past any horizon that you and I can see today. As the child's prayer goes, it says, God is good, God is great. It's a pretty, pretty simple prayer. God is good and God is great. And He is and He will make it work. But often His greatness and His goodness come together a little bit further down the road than we would wish and hope. But they will come together. It's a promise. A promise that we can depend on. C.S. Lewis <clears throat> said in one of his books, and I forgot which one that was in, that the problem that we have in discerning God's hand in our life is one of transposition. He explained that the sovereignty of God is like a symphony that fills a great concert hall with the most beautiful music that you can imagine. But sometimes you and I are not in that concert hall, but we're listening to the music on an old radio that has a lot of static and a lot of interference, and we're straining to hear the melody. We catch it here and there, a little bit there, a little bit there. And re that reminds me of years ago when I was first beginning to hear the broadcast of the World Tomorrow program. This friend of mine and I, we used to go up to a, an establishment called the Pig Stand, you can probably understand why it was called the pig stand. Had the best pork barbecue in town. And listened to the radio because we could pick it up better there for some reason or another. You could pick it up off of XCG coming out of Mexico. And that was back in the mid-60s. And it was static. It was full of interference and everything else. But it was the only place in general we could pick it up as well as we could. It was a lot of static, a lot of interference. But somehow or another, the message came through. Our regrets, our second guessing, mistakes that we make can sometimes even lead us feeling like we're alone. Almost as if God has left us to make it on our own. But when we totally accept the truth and the concept of the complete and total sovereignty of God in our life, we can rest in the sure knowledge that God is in control. He is the author of the story of our life. But at the same time, He has still given us the freedom to make choices. We have to make right choices, both bad and good. But while there may not be a yellow brick road that we can find or a green path that leads to the financial success like with Fidelity, we do belong to Christ. He has set the example. He paid the price for our mistakes. And life is totally understandable when we put all of this, all the weights of the life that we live in, in the sovereignty of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 9, 19, it says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God is, stands sure, stands absolute, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are His. He knows you. He knows me. But the choice is ours. Is He really, completely, and totally sovereign in our life and all that we do?